So turn in your Bibles, if you would, there. If I was to ask you, why do we do this? Why do we gather? Some people would see this as an odd thing, right? Like, go to church, why? Does anyone ever, everyone ever ask you that? Why? Why do you go? Why are we here? I'm going to argue this morning that we're here because somehow we need realignment. Anyone, anyone's life this week pulling a little bit to the right? Anyone's life this week pulling a little bit to the left? Like, we, we come here, and I think we forget that this is a place where we can come and whew, take a deep breath and go, okay, let me refocus, God. Because Lord knows our, our days full of distractions. Our days are full of things that uh, are not life-giving sometimes. And let me just be honest, like, we're tired, we're weary, a little beat up maybe. Some of you look a little beat up, I'm just being honest. In the name of Jesus, you look beat up. Right? We, somehow, we know church should be a place where we can go and just, I, I need this. I need you. I need God. Who is like the Lord? I need to be reminded of stuff like that. Yet I think we, we still come here and I think we forget why this is important. Why, why are we here? Years ago, a pastor stepped down from leading a pretty large church here in, a, in, the, in the States. Uh, and in his resignation letter, he said these words. I'm tired and I'm broken and I just need some rest. He said, leaders who lead on empty don't lead well. And for some time now, I've been leading on empty. And so I believe the best thing I can do is step aside from this church. More than ever, I need your prayers. I need your support. We've said that this is the church where it's okay not to be okay, and I'm not okay. I appreciate the honesty, and I appreciate the transparency. I appreciate the vulnerability. And if it can happen at that level, it can happen to any, any of us. And I want you to know it's okay to not be okay. But I also want to breathe some encouragement into this room this morning. And not me breathe it, the Spirit breathe it. I think, I think this, is, this is a great place to, to get that realignment, you know, to refocus. The word he used I love is rest. Can you write that word down in your notes, rest? Because I think we hear that word, but we can't, we don't experience that word. Rest. Somehow, God is working or is trying to work rest into our lives, and for some reason, we continue to resist it. Somehow, I think we feel like we're so in control of our lives that we so need to be available to everyone and everything at any given moment because somehow it, it, it depends on us. And I think today is a reminder where God says you need to rest and you need to stop that who is like the Lord who's working nonstop, you don't have to work nonstop. The reason you're worried and anxious is you're worried and anxious about things that you ultimately don't have control over. So just be still and know that I am God. It's not a trick question. Be still and know that I am God. When you hear that, that psalm, it, it should be like, wow, when was the last time I was just still? When was the last time I just rested? My prayer is that this morning the, the rhythm of rest would become a regular part of your lives. The Bible speaks of this repeatedly. Here's, we all agree on God's saving grace. 
If I mention, what is God's saving grace? If you answer Jesus, A+. Plus. Matter of fact, if I ask any question, you say Jesus, you, you're, you got it. Is Jesus not the answer to every question? Sure. But while we may be dialed in on God's saving grace, what we tend to miss out on as his, his people is his sustaining grace. See, it's one thing to be saved by his grace, but it's another thing to be sustained by his grace. It's almost like we come to Jesus, he stamps our get out of hell free card, and we're like, good, okay, God, go ahead and be my co-pilot, I got this. If you're ever behind a car that's got that license plate, just get, get, in, get in front of them. I don't trust anyone who's got that kind of bumper sticker on the car. God is my co-pilot. That's the problem. That's the problem. We, we go ahead and take things in our own hands and let God kind of take the, the, the side seat. And we're like, I got this. And God's like, you don't got this. Is God's sustaining grace is the grace that meets us in our tiredness, our weariness, our brokenness. We, we tend to be reticent in remembering what does the sustaining grace look like. And I think the passage this morning that we're going to dive into reminds us where is this sustaining grace to be found? How is this sustaining grace to be cultivated in our, our lives? Because I talk to too many people who are tired and weary and, and beat up, and you're like, that's not me. And I look at you and I go, yeah, you, you are. I look, I see it in your face. You are beat up. You are tired. You are weary. So what does sustaining grace look like? Well, Exodus chapter 16, I think, has some answers for us because I think sustaining grace is found in three things we're going to talk through this morning. This is not exhaustive. These are just merely three things I want to I want to talk about that I think are very life giving. Obedience. Community. And then rest. And what do those things look like? Well, let's look at Exodus chapter 16. If you would stand with me as we read God's word together. Exodus 16 We've already begun the conversation last week about manna. We talked about quail. Some of you got an appetite for that. I heard the butchers this week sold quail like crazy. I know, so good job. Manna, maybe not so much. I don't know. What is it? <laughs> manna. Uh, so we talked about that last week, and then today the conversation continues, and God really brings, I think, some things into, into perspective that I think are going to be helpful for our, our hearts and our spirits today. Exodus 16 verse 22 now it came about that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread two omers for each one when all the leaders of the congregation came and told moses then he said to them this is what the lord meant tomorrow is a sabbath observance a holy sabbath to the lord bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning wait i thought he said if you keep it till morning it's going to rot and be full of worms. But they put it aside until morning as Moses ordered, and it did not become foul, nor was there any worm in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. So it's a special day. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather, but on the seventh, the Sabbath, there will be none. And it came about that on the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather. Losers, right? Didn't they, they just not get told? It's not going to be there. And they found none. Duh, God said this. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? Wow. Application question, right, for ourselves. How long do we continue to refuse to keep his commandments and keep his instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you bread for two days on the sixth. Remain every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel named it manna. It was like coriander seed white, and it tastes like wafers with honey. Sounds delicious. Then Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer full of it be kept throughout your generations, that they may see the bread that I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar, put an omer full of manna in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord had commanded Moses, Aaron placed it before the testimony or the Ark of the Covenant to be kept. And the sons of Israel ate the manna 40 years until they came to the inhabited land. They ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Verse 36, now an omer is a tenth of an ephah. Thank you, Moses, for that last note there. <laughs> May God write his eternal truths on our hearts. Amen? Have a seat. Three things we're going to talk about this morning. And I think they're really three life-giving vital principles 
that are drawn from this section and can be supported in, in other scripture, which I will give you. Uh, the first is this. There's a submission principle. And this is really why God allows Israel to enter into the season called the wilderness season. Uh, a journey that should have lasted a few days lasted 40 years because sometimes God's lessons take a long time in our lives. Amen. It takes uh, one night to deliver Israel out of Egypt, but it takes 40 years to deliver Egypt out of their hearts. Right? It's one thing for God to save you by his grace in Jesus. It's another thing for him to make you into a new creature in Christ so that you're conformed into the image of Jesus. So we all realize this takes time. One of the greatest lessons we can ever, ever embrace in our Christian journey is this of submission, obedience. Right? The reason why our lives often uh, are, are disastrous or difficult is because we make decisions that aren't in line with God's will, right? God knows what's best, and yet I sit there and I wrest control from him, and I go, no, I know what's best, and there ensues this battle, and when you play wrestling with God, you're always going to end up a loser. How many times I've yelled the uncle with God, it's got, it, doesn't, it doesn't work, you don't win. And how many times has God been patient and gracious? How many times do we read in the scripture and then Israel did what was right in its own eyes? Time and time again. We're not, we're not different. We're not here to judge. We're here to say, I can identify with this. Right? God clearly says, one way you can trust me is by in obeying what I say. Here's the good news. God doesn't look for you to obey and then rescue you. He rescues you and then he gives you his instructions. We, we need, he delivers them from Egypt, sets them free, and then says, let me give you the rules for life. We get this reverse. We get this reverse. We think, well, God will only accept me if I follow X, Y, Z. That's not true. That's what we would call a works-based righteousness, and that's not how God loves you. God loves you in your worst, most despicable, awful state of rebellion and disobedience, says, I'm going to make you mine, and then once he sets you free, he, he says, now, in order to live the life that I've designed for you, obey my commands. Love my law. He doesn't give you law, then relationship. He gives you relationship, then law. And so his instructions are always good. His instructions are always right. His instructions are always life-giving. It would do well for us to obey the word of our God. This is why he does what he does, and he takes us through wilderness seasons, and he gives us crazy food from heaven, and he, he throws some interesting obstacles in our way. He does it to test us in seeing how well we're going to follow his instructions. Deuteronomy chapter 8. How do I know what I just described to you? Because God's word says it. Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 through 3, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you. And let me just tell you, doing what he wants versus what you want is a lesson in humbling. Those, those times when you're like, you know what, I thought I knew, but I don't know. There's times I thought I had the strength. I don't have the strength, right? And God humbles us to help us so that we can honor him in all things, right? Testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. There it is. Do, do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are you going to do what he says? That's the greatest reflection of your love for God is obeying him. How come you say you're my disciples when you don't do what I tell you to do? Right? He humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. No one's known. It's a mystery food, right? Bread from heaven, angel food cake, right, essentially. That he might make no, you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Deuteronomy, but also uttered by the voice of Jesus himself in the wilderness, which tells me something. More than satisfying our appetites, God wants to shepherd our hearts. 
more than filling our bellies, God wants to shepherd our souls. We, we are preoccupied oftentimes by the wrong thing. We're, we're consumed by that which we see, that which we touch, that which we feel, the physical things, and we forget about the deeper, more substantive spiritual things. And this is what God is saying to us. Like, I don't want to be a God that just fills your bellies. I want to be a God who shepherds your heart. I want to see what you really desire. Your physical needs are always secondary to your spiritual responsibilities. God, though I may not have this money, house, car, food, whatever, I need you to know that I am still going to follow you and love me, love you with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm going to, I'm going to, this is my spiritual responsibility. And so God says, I want to love you. I want to provide for you. But submission looks like this, that you are more hungry to do what I want you to do than satisfy your own physical appetite. So submission principle. Verse 27, it says it right there. Verse 28, then the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? This is right on the heels of them being instructed by God what to do, and they didn't do it. So if you're one of those who God says for you to do something, and right away you do the exact opposite, you're in good company. You're in good company. But we need to learn, right? We need to learn. He knows what's best. Number two, there is the sharing principle. We see this, not necessarily in what we read, but just a few verses prior. Look at verse 17 and 18 of chapter 16. And then the sons of Israel did so. What did they do? They went and gathered. So this is what God says. Days one through five, I'm going to provide you fresh manna every single day. You get up in the morning, gather as much as you want, um, and then go to bed. Don't dare try storing manna. It's not going to last for tomorrow. It's going to smell. It's going to be putrid. Your neighbor's going to be really mad at you. Trust me the next morning to provide fresh manna for you. We'll do this for five days. Then on the sixth day, provide, I'm going to provide you t- twice as much. But on the seventh day, you're not to work at all. Because the twice, the amount twice as much the day before is meant to carry you over on that seventh day so that you have a day where you don't work and you rest. But notice what verse 17 says. And the sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much, and some little. What does that mean? It means someone in this room has really, really big hands and can grab a lot of manna. And there's some in this room that can have really, really, who's got small hands in the room? Just curious. Who's got small hands? Okay. So Kim goes out there, and she can only grab Kim-sized quantities. Who's got really big hands in here? Who's got big hands? I think Mike. Mike's got big hands. Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, look at those things. He can grab mike size quantities, right? And I just know, like, and there's people that have little hands and big hands, but I also know that there's people in Israel that have a competitive spirit. And they're out, and they're like waiting to get up, look outside their tent, they're like, manna! And they get out there, and they just start working. And they're like, as long as I beat Jim Bob over there, the amount of manna I collect today, I'm the winner, right? How many of you are competitive spirits in here, right? Like you see everything as a competition, everything as a game, everything's a contest, right? And then there's some people on the other end of the spectrum that are just lazy, <laughs> right? There's just people that are like, I don't care what time it is, I'm not getting up, I'm going to hit my snooze, I'm going to, I'll get out when I get out and get manna because I know it's going to be there. But meanwhile, the competitive ones have been out there for hours collecting the manna, right? But at the end of the day, here's the cool thing about this community. Whether you're competitive, whether you're lazy, whether you've got small hands, whether you've got big hands, no one at the end of the day lacked anything. Not one person in this crowd of two million people had any need. Why? Because they looked out for each other. They lived in community that was so tight, so caring, so compassionate, they looked out for each other. And I, and I often wonder, where, where's that kind of community today? Where we come together and all of a sudden we just go, no one in this room has a need. But you know what? I don't know that. Unless I'm like involved in your lives and you're involved in my life. 
right? Here's one thing that God said to the people. Don't merely go out and gather for yourself. Look out for others. This is not about hoarding and greed because you only have enough for that day. So you might as well look out for one another so that by the end of the day, you can confidently say God has provided all of our need and among our community, no one lacks anything. Can you imagine living in an environment like that? And then going to bed and going, I'm going to trust God for tomorrow. Rinse and repeat. We're going to do this all over again. Why do I say this? Because it is this passage that Paul brings up in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 15. It is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Why would Paul, some couple thousand years later, quote this, this moment? Because in chapter 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians, write this down, look at it later, the two great chapters on Christian generosity. And this is the central verse between the two chapters. He is saying to the early church, well, you need to understand the heart of God. He is a generous God. Matter of fact, the generous God is this God who's behind the gospel of Jesus that says, even though Christ was rich, he became poor for your sake so that in your poverty through him you might be made rich. If you're in Christ, you are rich, brothers and sisters. If you're in Christ, you lack nothing. And so may that serve as a motivation, Paul says. The gospel has compelled me. The gospel has changed me. The gospel is now convicting me to say, what do I have that I need to hoard and greed for myself when I know that there's people out there that have need? Move yourself to become such the type of person that says, I want to make sure no one in my life has any lack or need. Because the greatest antidote against greed is generosity. You want to become a more generous person? Start giving stuff away. You need help in that? I'd love to come along with side with you. Let's go to the bank together. Let's withdraw some money. Let's go out and just start. Would that be a fun thing to do? We'd be like Mr. Beast, but the Christian version of it or something, right? Like, But think about it. The antidote for greed, the antidote for hoarding, the antidote that says, I don't have enough, I need more, is generosity. This is what Paul's arguing. And all I know is that we need to exist in such a community that says we're looking out for one another. It's like those Easter egg hunts you have with your family. You know, and and having kids and watching your kids participate in Easter egg hunts. I've got two brawlers. uh, They're they're my sons named Addison and Hudson. They're my security. You know, back in the day, they were this big. Now they're this big, and now I don't go anywhere without them because I need some bodyguards. No, just kidding. They like to think they're my bodyguards, right? But these brawlers, I'll call them the Sons of Thunder, my sons, Addison and Hudson, they have a little cousin named JJ. And when we come to Easter time, we do those Easter egg hunts. You know who just, who just love doing those Easter egg hunts? My brawler boys. And they're like, I'm going to go get everything. I'm going to go find the you know, run. But then they recognize there's a little JJ who doesn't move as fast, who doesn't have as big as hands as those monsters do, right? He's going to need a little assistance. And here's what's fun. They go out, they collect Easter eggs. And even though JJ is always the one with the, the least amount, by the end of the day, he's got the most. Why? Because you know we're to look out for one another. You know you can only eat so many jelly beans or so many Reese's or silver dollars, <laughs> you know, if you're in my family, right? Like, oh, there's money involved. I'm getting in this game, right? Shove JJ aside and go collect some cash. <laughs> so we're looking out for each other, right? This is, this is what should set us apart as, as believers is this sense of generosity in that we live in a community that there's no need, But we can only do, that can't happen on a Sunday morning. Because time does not permit us to going deep with one another to find out what our needs are. Here's what time permits us to do on a Sunday morning. Hey, good to see you. Welcome. Oh, we got to sing. Oh, I got to get to my brunch. Got to go to, and all of a sudden we're gone. Which is why we must be intentional to cultivate community beyond this time. Getting into a small group together, grabbing time with one another, encouraging one another. What needs do you have? What is it that you're lacking? 
Because there's something interesting that pops up, not just here in Exodus, but Paul in 2 Corinthians. We live on a planet where every day God gives everyone what they need. But then you're going, but how come there's people with need? There's people that are hungry, people that don't have running water, there's people that don't have a house. Is because some places hoard more than they need, which means someone's going without something that they do need. Do you know the United States of America uses 70% of the world's resources? We, as this little nation, maybe not so little, are using more than we need. Which means somewhere, someplace, someone's going without because we think we need more. Let's just be honest. None of us in this room, I think, need any more than what we have. Matter of fact, probably a lot of us probably can do a lot less than, than what we have. Can I get an amen on that? So, here's what God's saying. Move. Move. You can't take it with you. I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. There's, there's no such thing. Right? You're not going to the grave with all your possessions. I mean, you could try it. It's going to be a pretty big grave, I guess. But naked you came into this world, naked you're going to leave. Paul's argument in Corinthians is that the world needs what you have. So we be, should be moving towards this more generous, more selfless, more self-restraining community than anything this world has ever seen before. As a matter of fact, this was one of the arguments with the Romans against the Christians in about the second, third century is that the Romans couldn't stop the swell of conversions to Christ because they said there is a love in this community and a selflessness in this community that we have never seen before as the Roman Empire. They tried to stop it by saying, we can do the same. And without Christ, you can't be compelled by that kind of generosity. And they threw their hands up and they said, well, I guess we got to just let it be, let it be. And all of a sudden, the, the church has never grown so much in the history of Christianity than it did the first three centuries of the church. Why? Because they loved one another. They looked out for one another. They, they provided for one another's needs. Here's the sharing principle. Have relationships with other believers and have relationships with people even outside the church where you can be set up in a place that says, whatever I can do, I want to help. I want to come and be a blessing to you. Because oftentimes the physical demonstration of generosity leads you to a spiritual proclamation of the one who is truly generous, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, which brings us to the last point, it's this. The Sabbath principle. And this is really what this, the rest of this, this chapter is about. Sabbath. What is Sabbath? What is, you've heard the word Sabbath? And I'm saying without the word black, Sabbath, put on. I mean, if, if you, when you think Sabbath, you're like black Sabbath, Ozzy. Like, I'm, I'm with you on that one, right? Like war pigs. Yeah, we're, we're in. We're good. But what does Sabbath mean? Have you heard the word before? How many of you, it's a foreign word. You've never heard the word Sabbath before. How many of you have heard the word Sabbath <laughs> before? What does it mean? I'm asking. Rest. Intentional rest. Ooh, Lori comes along and just spices it up a little bit. Rest, intentional rest. What else? Maybe some other? Rest in God. To cease. To desist. Here's what's amazing. First time it's ever used in the Bible, right here. Exodus 16, verse 23. And then Moses goes gangbusters with it. Not just once. Now, just what he mentions it throughout this, this passage. Why? Because God is introducing something new and something very life-giving. Sabbath rest. Think about it. What is the passage talking about? It's, it's telling us that God says, I want you to have an intentional day where you do nothing. Six days work. But on the seventh day, 
cease from working. And I'm going to make sure you cease from working because God almost forces the rest by saying, I'm not giving you anything. Take the sixth day, double up, and enjoy that seventh day from your lazy boy and just doing nothing. Some of you are going, I would love that. I would kill my neighbor for that. <laughs> no, I, I want this desperately. Rest. Being a business owner, 14 years since Sozo's been open, is that crazy or what? I talk to other business owners, and one of the things I've heard repeatedly as I've talked to other business owners is this. Man, it, I've, I've been open five years, and I've never taken a vacation. And I go, what? And they're like, you have? I'm like, I take multiple vacations. <laughs> because here's what I know. If I don't rest, I'm going to die. There's a proverb, Greek proverb, that says, if you keep the bow continually bent, it will eventually break. These people are like, how do you do it? I've owned this for 10 years. I've never taken a vacation with my family. I go, why not? If, if you're the type of person that can't take a break from anything, there's a problem of pride going on in your hearts that you can't take one day on a regular weekly rhythm and say, I don't have to do anything. So what do we do with this? Because here's the question. Well, it, it, Sabbath is Old Testament. Are we as believers, New Testament, are we to observe a Sabbath? What's the argument, right? Or what does the New Testament say? Because let's be honest, it's actually one of the Ten Commandments that's coming down the pike in chapter 20. But it's mentioned before God even gives the Ten Commandments as if this is important. And if we're honest, it's one of the, probably the ten, one of the Ten Commandments that we probably disregard the most. How important is this? I'm going to tell you right now, it is critically important. And it's too important not to talk about and encourage us in towards more rhythms of rest in our lives. And just so I can preface with what I'm about to say to you, I am not speaking of rest from a law vantage point. I'm going to speak to you about the importance of rest from a wisdom vantage point. Okay? Meaning, I'm not going to be able to say to you, here is the verse that says you must do this Sabbath on this day and do that. I'm not going to approach it from that angle, but I am going to approach it from the angle that says there is wisdom in regular rhythms of rest in our lives. Amen? Four things in how you can understand and cultivate rest in your weekly rhythms. Because this is so critically important that God says Sabbath is a gift given to you by me. And it is going to set you apart from any other nation in the, in the world. As a matter of fact, there is no ancient group that ever had a day off from work. History doesn't record anything outside of Israel and anyone given a, a, a one day. Why? Because for some reason, we are wired in such a way where there's, we never allow any sort of lull time, downtime, rest. We feel like we always got to keep working. As a matter of fact, how many of us are, are attached to this electronic dog collar called a smartphone? right? There's always emails to return. There's always work to be done after dinner, before bed, at night. You know, the, the circadian, is it called circadian rhythms, right? With the, what is it? Circadian. circadian rhythms, right? Arcadian rhythms, whatever. I don't, you know, there's this stuff, this demands so much of us, and we become slaves to our lives, slaves to our schedules, slaves to our boss, slaves to our work, and we don't know what it means to say, Hey, there's this off button on my phone. I can actually turn my phone off. Everyone, take out your phone, look at the off button, and press it down for at least three seconds. And if you don't want to turn it off, mute it. And if you don't like notifications, turn them off. There's all these features that we just somehow go, I can't miss it. I can't miss an email. I can't miss a text. I got I to gotta always be available. Really? You know what that mentality is? That's the mentality of a pharaoh. 
who says, I will be your taskmaster 24-7. You think Israel got rest while they were in Egypt? And here's a God who says, I've delivered you, and I've delivered you to obey me, and I've delivered you to live in community, but I also want you to know that there's going to be one day every week that I'm going to gift to you to say, be still and know that I am God. Some of you are going, tell me more. (laughs) Rest must become a regular part of our weekly rhythms. And I'm not speaking as someone who's nailed this, but I am speaking as someone who knows how to recreate. Ask my wife. (laughs) She's like, what did you do there? I go, absolutely nothing. She's like, how would you do that? By saying no, by taking off without certain technologies, mountain biking, just me and the javelinas out there just enjoying ourselves. Like, think about it. There is no one in this room who cannot take time away from your normal routines and have rest. Your life is not that important. I love you. But your life is not that important. Your spirit, your soul is of grave importance. But your job title, the identity you derive from being a mom, dad, brother, whatever, all those things we tend to try to find value and significance from don't matter other than you being still and knowing that he is your God. This is why Moses spends, not this just chapter, but Sabbath speaking language, even into the New Testament, Jesus talks about Sabbath. So four things. Number one, resting ultimately is about God's person. So before we talk about habits and disciplines and rhythms, we must always understand, I am not inviting you to do activities or cease from activities I'm inviting you to him who is our eternal rest, and his name is Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene and says in Matthew 12, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Boom. (laughs) I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. All right, guys, what do you want to talk about now? It's like, he's flexing, man. This is awesome. Why? Because the Pharisees had made the Sabbath such a a big thing, such a burdensome, burdensome thing, they forgot the blessing that the Sabbath was about, and they made it into a burden. That's why when Jesus healed and did miracles, oftentimes it was on the Sabbath. You want to know why? Because he was just looking to get these guys. Anytime the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, say, and Jesus did this on the Sabbath, you should hear some ominous music playing, like, "Uh uh-oh, showdown at the OK Corral. Here we go. You know, I'm a horrible whistler, I know. Like a Western, right? And he did this on the Sabbath because the religious leaders were furious that he was healing people, loving people, providing for people. They had forgot it was a gift from God. They turned it into a burden. And this is what Jesus says. I am the Sabbath. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I have given this day to you as a gift. Augustine, one of the greatest minds ever in Christian history, 1,700 years ago, said these words, probably one of the greatest quotes ever. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. See, Augustine, for a long time, thought he had to work for God's favor. He thought he had to work for God's approval. None of us are designed for that. The more you think workspace righteousness, the more defeated and and destructive that that lifestyle is. And here's what Augustine says. There's an invitation from Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, that says, come all you who are weary and heavy laden and come to me and I will give you rest. Rest. Right? Jesus doesn't say, okay, now leave and follow these 10 commandments, leave and follow these 20 principles. He says, come to me. Resting is first God himself. As a matter of fact, this is the greatest thing God can open our minds to is this, that we don't need anything in our lives but him and the best thing God has for us is himself. And yet we forget this. 
I'm so grateful Jesus doesn't say, let me point you to rest. Let me lead you to rest. He says, the deepest rest your souls crave is found in me. Come to me all you who are weary and I'll give you rest. So first and foremost, rest is a person. God. Secondly, resting in God's purposes. Do you realize or have we forgot that resting is part of the original creation ordinance? Genesis chapter 2. How many days did it take for God to create everything? Good answer. Some people say seven. I go, no, gotcha. Six days, but on the seventh day, what did he do? Rested. Whoa. Now, let me ask you, does God need to rest? Is he that kind of God that gets tired? I mean, because if he is, boy, he probably got tired with me day one. Like, I can't keep up with this Morgan guy. He is such a sinner. He is so awful. Like, I need to take a break. God never rests, right? He never grows tired. He does not grow faint. He does not grow weary. Who is like the Lord God Almighty? But he rests on the seventh day as a way to say, I am establishing a pattern for all of humanity. This is before Israel became a nation. I want, un, I want humanity to understand that there is a work-rest rhythm that is essential to your lives. Seven, six days you work, seventh day you rest. God's purpose, once again, is for you not to be defined by what you do, but whose you are. Here's our problem. We tend to put so much of our value and worth and purpose and significance and identity in the things that we're involved in that we lose sight of forgetting I'm his and I'm his not by what I do but for what he's done for me. And that I don't have to live a perpetual state of busyness to somehow justify my, my place on earth. My existence with you and before him. See, God's purpose for us is to understand that Sabbath is a gift and we need rest. Science has told us, and I want you to listen to this because this is mind-blowing. In, in a 24-hour period, the average adult, their heart beats 104,000 times in 24 hours. Their, your blood travels 168 million miles. You're, you're, you breathe 23,000 times. You inhale 438 cubic feet of air. You eat th three and a half pounds of food, four and a half pounds in my, in my world. You drink 2.9 quarts of liquid. You speak almost 5,000 words. You move 750 muscles. You exercise 7 million brain cells in 24 hours. No wonder we need rest. Your blood travels 168 million miles in a 24-hour period. Is that not? That's pretty amazing. And because God has wired us such, and there's nothing else in creation like us, he says to us, take a day off every week. Mark 2.27. Jesus says this. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What's Jesus saying? Sabbath is God's gift to you to say, you as God's child are allowed to do this. Let this day be a blessing. Cease from your labor Rest in me. That's what this time's about. You can come in on a Sunday morning as you are, where you are. <sighs> Take a deep breath and say, I need to be restored. I need to be reminded of what's really important. Because guess what? Your job is important, but it's not of ultimate importance. How you do as a dad, mom, husband, wife is important, but it's not of ultimate importance. 
who you are as God's son or daughter, that is what we're focused on. Right? This is, this is what we need to work on and, and think about. And I say work because that almost seems counter. <laughs> like, this is what we need to dial in on is that God says there is a day to bless you and not burden you. There's a day for you to rest and also refocus. Because Lord knows we've been distracted. We're distracted, guys. Think about what's just politics. Side note, can I just, re- and you're going to get reminders until the, till the election and then a- after. You know what? Whoever you vote for, that's between you and God. But in Christ, we are called to unity and harmony as believers. Let me say it again. I have seen and heard too many believers in churches break fellowship because they don't have an RRD like they have an RRD. Can I just tell you right now, it doesn't matter in the big scheme of things. Exercise your right to vote. Fight for your right to party, just like the BC boys. Uh, Go out and do your thing, but who you vote for, that's between you and God. But may your politics never interrupt your fellowship that we have in Christ as a church. Okay, I'm going to remind us of that repeatedly. Because I've seen too many, too many, too many Republicans, Democrats, donkeys, elephants. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we can fellowship together. Jesus himself called two ends of the political spectrum to, his, to be his disciples. He had an extreme left liberal in his crew, and he had an extreme right conservative. You know who they were? The right conservative was Simon the Zealot. And the extreme liberal was Matthew, the tax collector. And Jesus called them both and said, be my disciples. You know what Jesus is saying? You're all welcome to the table. Because in the end, it doesn't matter, Democrat or Republican. What matters is the party of the lamb. All right, let's come back. It could have been worse. I, I, you guys got it easy. First service, I don't know so much. They were, they were leaving a little bit crying, beat up a little bit today. In the end... We're reminded that Jesus is all we need. Corey Ten Boom, famous book, The Hiding Place. Great quote. She said this. Look at this. You may never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. I think a day like today is helpful. That we don't need anything else but Christ. And we're good with that. We're good with that. Point number three. We're going to rest in God's provisions. Let me remind you real quick. Um, Psalm 84, 11. No good thing does God withhold from those who love him or walk uprightly. Which means in Christ, God is looking out for you. And he's not going to withhold anything good. But the greatest gift from God, and let's think about the ultimate provision, is salvation in Christ and the finished work of Jesus on the cross on our behalf. Can I get an amen from from anyone who just wants to acknowledge that? Is the finished work of Christ the greatest gift God can give us? And I say finished because it is finished. He's done it all. And now I believe and I receive the righteousness that Christ earned for me. I could never earn for myself. And he's forgiven me my sins that I'm no longer condemned. I'm free in Christ forever. So now that he's provided me that, (laughs) huge, now I can just live for him and trust him. And that's why he says, pray this way, give us this day our daily bread. So now the life of a disciple who's been redeemed by him, the finished work of Christ on the cross, says, I'm now dependent on God for everything. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That ties into the first point of submission. When you're obeying the the word of God, there's no safer place than that. The safest place to be is in the center of God's will. It's the safest place to be. And no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And so then I look at this account in Exodus and I go, God provided everything two million people needed for 40 years. They did not skip a beat. He did not decide one day I'm not. He was consistent in his love and his provision for Israel. What am I worried about today? If God's going to take care of the needs of two million people for 40 years without skipping a beat, what am I worried about today? That he's not going to take care of me? Are you kidding me? How will he now not give you all other things? Trust him. 
Trust him. People today are still scrambling, still hustling. How do... How do I rest in God's provision? Let me tell you two things real quick, and let me encourage you in this. You can't be satisfied in what God's providing me at any given moment. You must take care of that yourself. So there's a sense in which our journey does not rely on me feeding you. It relies on you feeding yourself. I remember when I was a college pastor, I had this girl go, I don't know if I can stay in college ministry anymore because I don't feel like you're feeding me anymore. And I said, excuse me, passage verse where it's my responsibility to feed you? And she's like, oh. oh. I, you, you know who's responsible to feed you? You. Wait, what? what? If you come once a week going, I can't wait for Pastor Scott to feed me. Yeah, I'm like, you're going to be let down. Because we, we can come feed together. But what are you going to do tomorrow? Because all I know is I need to eat three times a day, sometimes five if the Spirit's leading me. <laughs> Spiritually speaking, does Jesus, Jesus leads us to green pastures. But he doesn't kneel down and eat for us and then regurgitate into our mouth. He says, here's food. He leads us beside still waters and says, lap up. You have a responsibility as his disciple to feed yourself. With all the resources, he has set the table for you in the wilderness. Dine. But many of you are tired, weary, broken, beat up. Why? Because you haven't learned to feed yourself. And God has set up a table for you in the wilderness. Dine and dine like crazy because the bounty is, is it's huge. Eat all you want. God is an all-you-can-eat God. Can I get an amen from somebody? My four favorite words, all-you-can-eat. Eat, he'll never run out. Drink, the fountain will never end. But number two, I can't expect today to have the strength that nourished me yesterday. Your nourishment yesterday doesn't necessarily carry over today, and I can't borrow on tomorrow's potential nourishment. I must eat today. And too many of us think we can hoard, 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 greed, greed, greed here, and think, I'm going to be good today, and then we're just like, I'm double tired because you haven't feasted. It is a daily table set for you. Eat like crazy. This is how God provides for us. Again, if we're always working and never waiting, if our society is in desperate need of rest, if our words tend to be tired and busy, we're answering emails after dinner, taking calls on the weekend, God is not important. You're important. And he says, stop. Let me ask you, brothers, sisters, do you long for righteousness? Good news is he's already won it for you. Do you yearn for an identity? Well, guess what? He's already called you his own. Do you want success? He already shares with you his victory. Do worries keep you awake at night? Guess what? He's shouldering every bur burden of yours. Do you lack favor from others? You have his. He loves you like crazy. Any kind of restlessness, any kind of care our soul needs, Jesus has it. Are you resting in his provisions? And lastly, are you resting in his promises? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Be still and know that I am God. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. This, in the end, doesn't depend on you. This, in the end, is on him, his reputation, his character, his glory. If God has spared us by giving us his own son, how will he not also provide for us everything else we need? Rest in his promises. Because he is a compassionate and caring God, and he wants to remember how good he's been with Israel, 
with the disciples, with the apostles, with the early church, with us. Can you think back on your life and look at God's fingerprint all over your life and how he's taking care of you and how he's provided for you? And, and what does he tell Moses? He says to Moses, here's what I want you to do. Now we're going to do a third miracle, right? So not only is there the miracle of daily providing manna, and you can't hoard it on days one through five, and then doubly providing manna on day six, and then somehow saving it so that it doesn't rot on day seven. And then he says, Moses, take an omer full. I don't even know how much. I don't even have a thing of, oh, is it, what's an omer? Is it two cups? It's about a quart. Take two, put it in a jar, and I want you to save it for 40 years as a reminder that I'm a God who provides for my people. And guess where that jar of manna was placed? Ark of the Covenant. Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones, there it is, all right there. Three things were placed in the Ark of the Covenant. Jar of manna, Ten Commandments, and Aaron's rod that budded. The budding rod. That was your nickname in high school, wasn't it? I thought so. Three things. Three things. Aaron's budded rod, Ten Commandments, jar of manna placed inside the Ark of the Covenant, a perpetual reminder that your God is prophet, priest, and king. King, the law has been given. Priests, the rod of Aaron has budded. And the manna, your God speaks words of life for your soul in which you will never hunger again. Remember this always. Is your God your prophet, priest, and king today? Because in Christ, he is not only that today, he will be that forever. Because Hebrews concludes with this verse, chapter 4, verse 9. You've entered rest in Jesus, but there is a rest that you have yet to enter into as God's people. Eternal, everlasting rest that's promised to you forever. Can we taste it now? Yeah. But will we experience the full consummation of it one day? Yeah. We'll be free from work. We'll be free from bosses. We'll be free from performance reviews. We'll be free from schedules. We'll be free from demanding people, coworkers. We'll be free from feeling like we've got to prove ourselves and somehow form our identity by what we do. And God says one day you'll be free from sin, death, the grave the enemy, and you'll be free in Christ forever because there is a Sabbath rest that is called heaven where we'll be his in unbroken fellowship forever. And all God's people said, Amen. so what rhythms will you establish in your life this week? I just asked my wife the other day, I said, how can I make my Sabbath time better? I take Sabbath time, but it can be better. That kind of Sabbath time that says, I don't know, maybe you need a pastor's note. I've got a pad ready to go. If you need a pastor's note for work, my pastor says I need to take it out. I'll sign it for you. If you need a to be continued conversation, I want to be here to just encourage you in this. I want you to encourage me in this. I want you to know that I'm at the coffee shop Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday mornings, 8 to 11. I'm sitting where Brian Oliver's at. Hi there. That's El Jefe's spot. I should have a sign that says Lucy, psychiatrist, five cents right there. For anyone that wants, but if you want to come hang out and talk about this more, I would love to come alongside of you, pray with you, talk with you, share wisdom, advice, things I've learned, things that you can share with me so that we can be a more restful people. Because if Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath and He gives rest, whew, we need to delight ourselves in that. Amen, church? We need to delight ourselves in that. So if I call you tomorrow and you don't answer, I'm going to say they're on rest. If you call me tomorrow and I don't answer, I'm on rest too. We need to schedule this. We need to make this part. So we'll make this a to-be-continued conversation because it comes up again in Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. So we'll be there in 2027. So uh, <laughs> when we get there, hopefully you've all established rhythms of rest and we don't even need to talk about it, but we'll talk about it in the Ten Commandments. So uh, love you guys. Praying for you. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this time just to refocus and be realigned, Lord. Um, 
we're, we're all in different places in our lives, but the centrality of, of Christ is, is of utmost. Lord, while we may be living different lives, we have one Savior, one faith, one baptism, one word, one God who's orchestrating all things, one path that you would want us to walk according to your will and your instruction. So Lord, thank you for this time for all of us to come together and, and to be realigned on one thing, and that's you. The, the greatest gift you have given to us is yourself. Thank you, God. So, Lord, work in our hearts, work in our lives, work in our schedules. Forgive us for the, the, the busyness we've embraced, for the workload that we have embraced, and perhaps we've, we've made too much of certain things idols. Maybe we've made too much of ourselves. We think of ourselves more highly than we should. Help us to work in regular weekly routines of rest. Help us to look at our, our schedules and go, this is the day that I'm going to stop and be still and know that you're God. And help us to do that with one another. Boy, what a restful community we could potentially be. Thank you, God, for this day and for this instruction. May your spirit water the seeds that have been planted. And may we respond to you based upon what you've done in our hearts today with a sense that you are to be revered, you're to be worshipped, you're to be adored. And by glorifying you, that, can <laughs> that, that is purpose for, for our lives in and of itself. So thank you, Father, for loving us first, for giving us rest in Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great day. Enjoy some rest. Turn off your phones.